Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Cabinet meeting held on Thursday, the 31st of August 2023. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, first item on the agenda is uh, apologies received for absence. Is anybody aware of any? Our next item, we need to declare any interests. Are there any declaration of interest? Uh, right, item number three is um, question time. Are we uh, answers to questions from the public domain in pursuant of executive procedure rule number 13? Are we aware of any? Uh, matters are referred to the Cabinet in accordance with the overview of our scrutiny rule procedures. No. Item number five, well that's in, uh, in my hands uh, and it's a report from the leader regarding the medium or the budget and the medium term financial pl planning process 24-25 which are pages 5 to 48 of this document. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek a agreement to the proposed budget and proposed budget and medium term financial planning process for the general fund and the housing revenue account for the years 24 to 25. The recommendations are that it is recommended that the purposes, the proposed process for the general fund and the housing revenue account budget for the medium term financial planning should be adopted. There is an executive summary, which is quite long. Um, I'll open it up to any questions on that report. <coughs> Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> just around the, so the surveys, we're going to sample 1,200 residents. Um, I just wondered from officers, was that, is that the same as in previous years? And if so, what kind of take-up did we get? Have we struggled to achieve that in the past? Um, Give me a bit of insight there, please. I can answer that one for you, Councillor. Um, last year, we contacted 1,500 local people, inviting them to take part. But ultimately, this survey is a self-selecting sample. So this is where we advertise the survey, we promote the survey, and we encourage anybody in the borough to take part. Contacting those particular addresses is just one way that we're encouraging people to take part. Um, last year, I think we we did get um, people taking part from that way. Um, it's just another communication mechanism to get to a wider audience. I'll come back on that then. So <clears throat> what, why, have we gone, why have we reduced the number? Is there a, from 1,500 to 1,200? Oh, it was just because this time we're, we're trying flyers as well so we're trying a different mix of communication mechanisms this time so we've produced some flyers that we're hoping to be giving out at the wheel of tamworth event so we're, we're we're shifting our mix of marketing opportunities to maximize the message getting out there so we're giving them more more ways to, to join so we're not restricting cause if you go from 1500 to 1200 on the face of it it looks like we're restricting a resident uh, participation but in fact we open up more channels to get more people to participate. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just draw your attention to question two. Um, in it, it says your local area receives uh, services from two councils, Tamworth Borough Council and Staffordshire County Council. This survey asks about Tamworth Borough Council and, it, uh, and at that point then you... You, you you take you go into uh, a, a fair few examples of um, what Tamworth Borough Council does, i.e., collection, street cleaning, and planning. Is there any way uh, that we can also add in what the what the count uh, what the county council offer as well, just to make people aware that the the, the county council uh, do do such things as uh, they're responsible for road repairs and potholes and and. Uh, uh, a, f a few other sort of uh, county councils because I think there is, um, you know, if you speak to most people as we do as councillors, um, uh, 
not a lot of people understand the difference between the county and the borough um, and they associate uh, we are just the council and I don't blame them we're not we're not as close to, they're not as close to it as we are so if we can split that out so we can give a few more examples of what county do and a few more examples of what borough do and then that way then people understand fully where where the results of this are going we have included that in the introduction so the bits that those taking part, I think it's on page 31 of your report, um, we've, we've gone into more detail of what Tamworth Borough Council services are and then put some lines about what county do, such as, you know, services for older people, children, libraries, etc., roads, potholes. But if it's not clear enough, we could reiterate it at question two. Yeah, I just think just because that, that question, that second question is directly asking... Um, about the local area receives services from two councils. I think it just, we, we, yeah, we, we don't have to go into, it doesn't have to be an exhaustive list, it just, uh, just mention certain key items that uh, the county are, are responsible for delivering and what borough are responsible for delivering. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just on that same question, I think even on page 31, um, that last sentence other services like it, although it's there it's not particularly uh it doesn't stand out so you know you could perhaps have a split that out have a have it services such as these are not provided by Tamborough council or mm. something that's very clear put bold not in bold or something and then list them with bullets like the others are above so it makes it really clear because when you, you know your eyes are drawn to the bullets yeah but down there it's very easy we've done it so you skip straight past it because it's just an additional sentence at the end um, just, just to make it really clear for people. Just a suggestion. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just one as well. I, I don't know if I've missed this. Um, is, is this going out into an electronic format as well? So, will it be going out via email, and and it, uh, will it be sort of QR coded so that people can just scan it and, and do it quite easily on a mobile device? Yeah, it's it's mainly an electronic methodology um, because obviously it's digital by default. It's it's easy for people to fill in. Um, we've just made the paper copies available for people who aren't able to access those services. Um, the flyer that we're handing out will be directing people to the website with a QR code. Um, and we've got the hard copies available at the TIC and we're actively encouraging um, our customer services people to be sharing the survey with people um, so we're, we're trying to maximize as much as possible everybody's opportunity to take part we will also be emailing out to our citizens panel members um, any other databases that we've got such as businesses community voluntary sector etc oh fantastic that's good to hear thank you thanks for that uh, just one question from me. How many years have we done this? And is there any trend that we can see? This is the second year in this format where we've put the, 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 state, the state of Tamworth kind of things together with the budget. But some of the questions, we do have comparisons from previous years as well. So once we've got three, we'll be able to determine a trend. Anything else? Oh. Smith. Yeah, on um, page seven, um, you've got the uh, GF and HRA accounts. Uh, you've got best and worst case scenarios, and you've got the variances. There's quite wide variances. Um, just wondering, like, what's what's the reason for um, that distance, and could there be anything that could bring it closer? Just some sort of, uh, you know, explanation around that, if that's okay. I can answer that. Um, this is actually an extract from um, the more detailed MTFS position that's part of the corporate performance health check later on in the agenda. What we do is set out um, a central case forecast, and then a best case and a worst case scenario. Um, so really we're kind of assessing, well, um, for example, if the pay award is higher than we had budgeted, then that obviously our, our costs are going to increase. If we're able to um, recover more income, um, then that's something that's going to make our financial position a little bit better. So there's, 
there's several different um, different areas that we build into that. To comment on that for Councillor Smith as well, is, is it correct that we can, as, as we go through that in detail through the, the process, for want of a better expression, you, you will essentially pick a mix between which uh, which rows have which scenario attached to them based on you know what we think is most probable. It's not you know one or the other for the yeah, whole. Yeah. That's right. So as we move through the the process, so it'll be refined as we as we move through and as we add in policy changes and so on. Yeah. Any more questions? Right. If, uh, if there are no, no more questions, uh, I'd like to move this report. All those in? That's a second. Just before you take a vote, Chair, um, just for Governance point of view, are you content that the amendments discussed on the form um, are delegated to yourself for final sign-off as, as part of the Governance process? Yes. Right, with that clarification. Good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's always good to be clear. Uh, yes, uh, no problem with that. Uh, right, well, just well to the vote. All those in favour? To the contrary. Thank you. Right. Our next item on the agenda. Again, is the uh, item number six, which is the quarter one, 2023-2024 performance report, uh, which is on pages 49 to 144 of this document. And again, that's uh, in my uh, responsibility to present that. I'm just flicking to the pages. Right, I mean, the purpose of this report, it provides the committee with the overview of the council's performance of the first quarter of 23-24 financial year, which is April to June 2023. The report, it, it reports the position related to the progress of strategic corporate projects and updates on the financial position, the corporate risk, audit, information, governance and complaints. Corporate, court, corporate scrutiny committees have considered the report, did consider this report on the 8th of August. And therefore, it is that I recommend that this, cab this cabinet endorse the contents of this report. Prior to that, are there any questions? Councillor? Thank you. Um, just a comment, really, and correct me if I've missed this, and I'm going to look very silly if I have missed it. But in the last meeting, I mentioned that in all previous reports, we used to have a page that taught, had a table and showed through what scrutiny questions they'd asked, kind of things they'd been looking at. It always used to be the, like, the front page was a summary of what scrutiny they'd asked. And when we brought this last quarterly performance report, I mentioned it here, and uh, someone said, sorry, it's the first time I'm doing the report, it'll be there next time. Mm. It's not here still. <clears throat> so please, for the next time, can we have that back? It's a summary. If we go back to previous reports from last year or something you'll see it's a summary of everything scrutiny reviewed we can see what they're looking at we can see what people are thinking we can see what the other um, councillors are thinking and it can sometimes guide us to certain areas as well um, I think it's really useful everyone found it useful before so can we please make a double note of that this time that we get that in there for next time please If I can share yeah I think the, uh, the reason it, it isn't here this time is all, all questions are actually answered on the night um, there was nothing outstanding which has happened previously from scrutiny, but take on board the um, the comment you say it's um, it should be fairly straightforward to uh, to transpose the, the the scrutiny minutes into um, in, in, into the body of the report. Okay. Yeah, so, right. yeah, yeah. I think if you look back at the previous one, it wasn't about outstanding questions. It was points that had been raised more, so that the cabinet could then see what others are thinking rather than no. outstanding questions. Thanks. Thank you for that. Any uh, Councillor Cooper? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, 
just with regards to the report, obviously it goes through the quarter one highlights 2023. It mentions in there the setup of Microsoft Cloud environment Azure. Now, as um, I'm a big sort of believer in in, in pushing sort of IT solutions to uh, to to sort of modern problems. Um, can can we have a bit more information around that? Because from from what I see, I, I don't think. I work in an organisation that fully utilises Microsoft uh, um, Azure. I don't, I don't see that um, currently in in uh, the, the 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 council's organisation as fully sort of harnessing what the Azure platform offers. Um, personally, in regards to um, sort of cloud operating, uh, live documents, uh, uh, uploads, um, and I, personally, for me, I think that you would get more out of the Azure platform if there was more availability for mobile solutions out to the staff, particularly sort of the street scene staff. And so is, is there any way of some, I might be putting you a bit on the spot here, but is there any way that we can look at um, sort of expanding on that a little bit? Because we've, we've listed it in the, as a as a highlight, um, but I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of that statement. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the um, the highlight is that we have implemented Azure and set it up, but it isn't being used to its quite rightly to its full potential. But what I will do is ask um, Gareth, who's the head of ICT, to do a briefing note for Cabinet of uh, where we are and the plans um, going forward, because there are there are a lot more plans to use Microsoft um, platform to improve our services. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I think I think definitely it, it would be good for cabinet to sort of get sight of a roadmap of of where 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 we currently are as an organisation and, and where we need to be and how we're going to get there. Um, I, I do you know I do think that there's a there's a hell of a lot. We you know we use it all the time at work, um, and it broke my heart that I was going around the town looking at some of the good work people were doing, and I bumped into a council officer who, who was making. A recording, uh, but the details of benches on a on a paper and clipboard. It's it's it blows my mind because that should be on an iPad with an Apple pencil, automatically up, 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 updating the 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 cloud, um, and so that we can see in real time and the pictures that are associated with that asset updated alongside the uh, the individual asset detail. But I, I can't see as we're, we're we're there yet. Ultimately, it's a piece of paper that will go back to the office, probably in a shredder at some point. And then we'll have to do the, the, the exact same exercise again in another couple of years. Thank you, Councillor. The roadmap is part of the ICT strategy. And I'm pleased to update that we do have some apps, um, and particularly for the parks, play parks, where the officers go around with an app, take pictures, tick off the, um, the checks to say everything is safe. It then gets transferred electronically um, so that if there's any um, anything wrong, that then the um, order, work, works orders can be raised. So we, we have started on that journey, and the um, parks is the first one of the first apps in use, along with um, scheme managers use an app as well to do their daily visits to the um, residents. So we are there, and we're implementing more and more apps, and the IT team are actually implementing them internally. Yeah, thank you for that. It is a process that's going to be ongoing for all organisations, I think. Um, we all suffer from, you know, the computers taking the world over, which is, which is good. Um, right, so without any further questions, oh, Councillor Jay. We should get started with the first one. <laughs> um, no, there aren't too many. Um, <clears throat> The uh, local council tax reduction scheme, page 62, the one I'm looking at anyway, uh, live caseloads. So they're similar to where they were seemingly last year, right? So we had 5,100 at the end of March, we've got 5,134 live caseloads. But there was a downward trend before that. Um, my question is, within that 5,134, are they all within the SLA for to be answered, or is there a is that just a, is it normal just to have a live caseload like that and they're all within SLA, or is there a backlog and an issue and Pete and residents are having to wait an unnecessary long amount of time? Um, are you talking about the backlog for new claims or? It's the li live caseload figures. So it's this 60, is it 60, 60, yeah, 62. Right, so the live case so figures 5134? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's the, the, the number of current 
claimants that we've got on the local council tax scheme. So it's claimants, it's not live cases in there, they're being processed, but they're just no, no, a live no, claimants. They're, okay. They're, they're the claimants. Okay. Payment numbers. Good. Okay. <laughs> that makes more sense. Thank you. Any more questions? No, if that's the uh, case, okay, so I'm looking for somebody to uh, move it and settle it. Yeah, I'll move it. Paul yeah, Paul Thompson. Yeah. Okay. Right, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour? To the contrary? That'll be good. All right, next item on the agenda. If we can get to that page. Right, uh, and that's the uh, annual report of the Treasury Management Service and actual prudential indicators 22 23. Um, and this is uh, expertly looked at in the hands of our portfolio holder for operations and finance, Councillor Thomas J. Thank you very much. Not about expertly, but thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, as you mentioned, it's the annual treasury report. It's a requirement of the council's reporting procedures, and it covers activity 2022-23 and the prudential indicators for the same year. Uh, the report does meet all the requirements of the CIPFA code of practice on treasury management and the prudential code for capital finance and local authorities. Uh, the council is required to comply with both codes in accordance with regulations under the LGA 2003, um, and it provides an opportunity to review the treasury management strategy for the current year enables us to consider and approve any issues identified that require amendment. So the recommendation tonight is to approve the actual 2022-23 prudential and treasury indicators within the report, as in Appendix 1, and accept the annual treasury management report 2002-23. There is an executive summary there. Um, basically, we're ticking all of the regulatory uh, boxes, uh, complying with the codes, statutes and guidance. There were no issues regarding non-compliance. Um, the council maintained an average investment balance externally invested of 75.8 million and an annual return of 2.16. The budget was 37.3 million and 0.25% return, so uh, the council has benefited with that. The weighted average internal rate is 4.05, which is the same as the year before. Uh, the Treasury Management Function has achieved an outturn investment income of 1.6 million compared to an original budget of £121,000. So there's a significant um, positive there. And we received 458,000 dividends from the property fund investments. Um, so near on double um, the year before. And slightly above the budget. So the budget's 420, we received 458. However, the net value of those investments has, has fallen. Um, so, at the moment, as at 31st of March, the council's external debt was 63.06 million, which is exactly the same as it was the previous year. And external investments um, total 60.61, so down from the year before. Okay, so ticking all the boxes, positively affected by the uh, interest rates, um, and looking okay. So it's just a, a rubber stamping tonight, please. Thank you, Councillor. Jay, uh, any questions? I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So with uh, any further ado, I look forward to move that. Seconder. Thank you. Now we'll move quickly to the vote. All those in favour? To the contrary? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've seen this one before every quarter. Uh, the purpose is that we endorse the amount of debt written off for the period 1st of April to the 30th of June this year. Um, <clears throat> there's an executive summary there and it's listed out separately. So where the debt has been written off by counter tax, business rates, etc., and the total of 40.3K. Uh, 
We've then looked at the previous year just so we can all see the comparison, and it was seven. It's basically eight thousand pounds the year before, so it's a significant increase. Um, and we've added some reasons in there. Some major reasons were staff concentrating um, on collecting outstanding debt due to the effects of the pandemic and having to work on the additional energy rebate schemes. So they'll focus on that and not as focused on this. Uh, we have discussed whether would it would it merit another member of staff or something that costs less than that that but the the answer is at the moment uh, it wouldn't really have had a significant impact on that um not enough to merit another person at, at this point and those issues um aren't year long so it's just uh issues for that quarter it looks like at the moment so um happy to open any questions thank you councillor cooper yeah, so it, have we actually done a, a business sort of a, a business case analysis on that and based on that? Because I, I find it hard to believe that if we're writing off forty thousand pounds worth of debt because we've had staff focused elsewhere, that 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 wouldn't pay for it. It, it, it. Particularly if we were only talking a quarter. I would understand if we were talking about a financial year, but we're talking about a financial quarter. Surely, to surely to God that if we did have a number of staff working on it. We could drive down those write-offs and and actually we could show a sort of a you know um we could justify that or that other member of staff um even if it was a a, a part-time position I, I find it hard to believe that it hemorrhaging of forty thousand pound and a quarter down to staff resource that that wouldn't pay so it's uh well it's the difference right we're looking at paying the difference yeah um so you're talking 30 30 years just over 30k um for that quarter but on a graph it'd be like this it'd go up and straight back down for the next quarter so whilst now hindsight there might be an argument to say well perhaps a temporary member staff in that quarter mm. um but it's only when you you're really in that quarter you've been impacted by the energy scheme which won't be there for the, the other quarters um that you know about it so there might you know it's, i think it's one to monitor and it might be there's a learning from it in the future that if the government asks us to deliver some kind of scheme we perhaps look is there a, a a business case at that point to have a, an extra member or a part time or something, but uh, I don't know if Joe, you want to come back in there. But I think it's one to monitor, and if another scheme comes in from the government to assess whether we look at someone else part time for that quarter, perhaps will be my view. But I don't know if you want to come in, Joe. Thank you. I mean, yes, d during the, the COVID and the energy rebate schemes that we were administering, it we did do that mostly with our, our own team and um, of in house staff. So it did have a knock-on effect then of, of recovery and write-off um, in certain cases. We are trying to catch up as best we can. Um, and this may well then be a reflection of that, that debt that we would have written off previously, we now, we're now looking at that. And you know, if someone's deceased or business has gone in, into administration, mm -hmm. we're now doing that catch-up work. Um, but yes, I mean, we do keep the staffing levels under review and make sure that they, they are appropriate for the work that we've got on at, at any time. Yeah, if I could come back on that, because obviously you're asking us to make this sort of accept that rationale based off two sets of data. Now, it might be that the previous month you've shown has been a uh, quarter you've shown is a, a really good quarter for, you know, and, and it might it might be put, put a really good quarter next to a really bad quarter and you just say, well, it was just a one off. but. I don't know. I, I'd like to see more in that before we, we we're asked to sort of um, accept that uh, that rationale. Um, to be honest, uh, because um, actually over a year it might be that getting somebody in for six months or a part time contract or something may may just pay. And I, and I think we've yeah we need to sort of take a step back, look at the bigger picture, and make a decision based off the whole data set, not just to conveniently place data sets next to each other. Yeah, so you're, so you're right in a sense. So the, the it is comparing to the previous quarter. Uh, sorry, the the same quarter last year. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the quarter we approved a couple of months ago was similar. So it is a quite a spike. Um, and then the other thing as well. It says, correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, but it's written off from a reporting perspective. But the work to continue to try and recover it continues anyway. Um, so it's not like it's totally lost. Um, but yeah, I think again, I think. It's not, it's not a reason, I wouldn't say at this point, to, to look at extra staff, but if we see the same next quarter or something, then, then you probably would be doing 
100% different. If we see this gone back down like it looks like it has, yeah, then it's a blip. But if, if it continues, then I think we should look at it. Unless that's a policy suggestion for September from you for well, next well, member that, staff. Isn't there? Is it? Yeah, is it not, <laughs> uh, that, and, and, that's, and that's a kind of, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's what, that's what I'd suggest. I think you're right. But I think uh, you monitor for another quarter and see if it has dropped right back down to normal or, or, can, or continues on that trend. If you're happy with that. Councillor Smith. Yeah, Councillor uh, Cooper pretty much asked the same question as myself, but just to kind of more of a direct question, uh, this is for you guys, but are we saying that if if we did have additional headcount in TBC, officer headcount or temporary headcount, are we directly saying that that would um, reduce um, or increase the amount of uh, debt that could be recovered? Well, I'll come back first, but potentially in that quarter only, because this is the quarters affected, yeah. but it could still be that the reason they're written off, it could be that within there, the, the reasons are, are, the, are the same. Um, Joe, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, reiterate your point, Councillor. Um, for example, in the, in the appendices, you can see some further analysis of the types of debt and the amounts that, that are being written off. Um, so you can have a one-off large amount in a particular quarter, which will then impact on the figures going up and down. Yeah. Andrew can just, just come in on that. I think it's, um, I, I, I agree with all the comments. I think Councillor Jay sort of um, made the point I was going to make. We, we never actually sort of write the debt off completely if, it's, if there's the slightest chance it is recoverable. But there are, if, if an organisation goes into, in, in, into liquidation or bankruptcy, then that will put a large amount in um, in one quarter. Unfortunately, whatever you do, you're not potentially going to be able to recover that. So extra staff won't, won't help. Uh, and it is very much, it's, it's a very, I think it's quite an, an involved, um, sensitive role to try and encourage people to, to pay their debts because you know, debt is, um, is a very bad thing. It affects a lot of people. Um, and actually, to um, it, it, it's a case of um, agreeing with people how they can pay, rather than demanding that they pay. So it, it's it is it, it isn't just a case of um, more 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 bums on seats equate more money. It's uh, you know it, it's it's quite um, yeah it's, it's quite difficult. So we have to make sure that we can uh, um, facilitate payments as as best we can. In in a lot of cases, the the very very last resorts. Uh, for us as an organisation is, is is a right is, is a complete write off. Um, this this effectively gets it off our, our sort of our, our, our accounting books, but the debt itself um, they pursue every possible opportunity, uh, and it only gets written off when it really becomes statute barred. I think I'm I'm, I'm right in saying it, Jim. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think you know before we uh, finalise the budget for the for the next year and years, we, we'll have seen another two mm. potentially two quarters and be able to see if there's a continued trend but it doesn't look like it at the moment thank you any more questions councillor smith yeah sorry i got another one um apologies if this is actually on the report but per each sort of debt category i suppose is there like a number of different debt cases i guess I'm just looking at the chart, the, the tables on here. Uh, it might be on here. I can't see it on here, but it just gives a it just. It would just give a general sort of um, feeling of, you know, kind of actually how many how many cases there are and if that's particularly significant. Okay, I'll go to John this one. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so on on each of the appendices, you'll see um, there's a column called number number of accounts written off. Um, it is a bit small possibly but hopefully that tells you the, the information that you're looking for yeah um, I can't see anything wrong with that that's pretty good um, probably yeah probably move it to the centre of the column but that would just be a little bit me being picky but there you go <laughs> alright so I'm um, I'm happy to move it I guess second though. That's a Cooper. To the con well, let's have a vote. All those in favour? To the contrary. Duly moved. 
Uh, right, our next item uh, on this agenda is item nine, which is the update on the corporate comments, complaints, and compliments, which again is in the uh, capable hands of our portfolio holder, Councillor Thomas J. Thank you very much. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Comments, compliments, and complaints policy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> to the report this evening is to provide an update to Cabinet following the implementation of the, uh, I'll call it the CCC policy, uh, on the 1st of April this year, and it's recommended we endorse the contents. Um, it was approved by the previous Cabinet on the 23rd of February and formally implemented from the 1st of April. Um, it takes the organisation towards a strategic focus on learning from complaints rather than just on complaint numbers. Um, and then to support and empower the right culture around complaint handling and more effective resolution for customers, and in this case, mainly residents. Um, ensures we have consistent procedures in place, defined levels um, and standards of service. Um, the, where is it? Uh, in the new policy, there's no significant changes to the process for how to make a complaint. Um, and the two-stage approach remained, as did the right to escalate a complaint to the Ombudsman where the customer uh, remained dissatisfied. If you go further down, um, we, we've, um, there's a table that's got the number of requests. Um, you see it's largely uh, split across the areas. Street scene's got a few more, joint waste's got a few less, but it's uh, street scene, housing repairs, customer services and joint waste. Um, if a communication is deemed a complaint, it's recorded and assigned to the relevant service area and an acknowledgement with a reference number is sent to the customer. So that is good um, practice. Um, and reminders are issued to service areas when a complaint response is due and escalated. Um, complaint recording has improved. More information is now recorded, which in time will allow trends to be identified and, and for action to be taken. Um, <coughs> let's go down here. A bit highlighted, it's become unhighlighted on here now. Where is it? Um, yeah, here it is. Prior to implementation of the new policy in April 2023, uh, the previous policy, the Tellers policy, had not been reviewed since 2017, so as well um, due a review. Um, the review was required to ensure Ombudsman best practice was met, specifically that the council provides the best experience for complainants, takes on board learning, and recognises compliments and feedback um, regarding services. So it's been implemented. Um, still being, you see in the figures in the in the appendix, um, there are still some some out of SLA, but it's a it's a new procedure. So you're going to see that. Um, the positive is it's it's the start of building that culture to learn from complaints, and that can only be a good thing for for residents and for all of us. Um, so I'm happy to move it, but open to any questions. Thanks. Thank you for that. Any questions, Councillor Thompson? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering what the main stumbling block is, um, you know, to get those that are outside the SLA into the SLA. I reach out to Zoe on that one. Um, <clears throat> we are reporting to service managers and CMT on a regular basis. Um, Nikki and her team from Information Governance are, are escalating where necessary, and we're working with um, on working with ADs um, to talk to the service managers and support them but what we've um, added into this new process is where we can't actually respond within SLA uh, maybe it's a particularly complicated um, response then we're actually keeping the customer informed um, on a regular basis that is a serv as an improvement for what we um, for what we did before thank you really good Great bit of work, by the way. Uh, I'm just wondering if, could we not class a response as something, and I get what you're saying, that's why I'm asking sort of this question is, uh, could we not class the holding statement that we issue whilst we're investigating? Does that not count as a response within the SLA? Or is it actually a case of uh, complaint resolved that we're actually looking at? Thank you. 
Yeah, we are looking at complaint resolved and that is in line with um, ombudsman requirements, the code of practice for both the housing ombudsman and the local government and social care ombudsman do require that time frame. Our old time frame within the Teller scheme was way outside of that, so that was one of the predominant things for why we've reviewed the policy. And we are striving to do that and we are improving um, with that as well. Yeah, I, th I think that's a key key point. So the, the, the timeline has been, has been reduced, so it's in line with industry standard, um, which is obviously harder to achieve. The the um the point about holding statement with that class has has been resolved. You've already answered that it wouldn't, but that that would just mean places would just send holding statements and just say I'm 100 percent. When it came to the SLA, they'd be sending them out and ticking them off. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a it's a good question, but one to, to be avoided for that reason because it would just be the, the way to hit targets. Mm -hmm. We don't want that. No. Um, but yeah, so that like I said, the time scale has been reduced, and 60 percent within SLA. It's not good, but it's it's a new process, and we'll really see the next time this comes back. Um, yeah, hopefully, that should that should be improving. Yeah. Just very quickly, it's a comment, but well done on that. I know it's difficult, and I think you know certainly investigating things and getting a an end result is challenging. So, really well done on those figures. Thank you. Thank you, and it is down to Nikki and her team who are very tenacious in getting those responses back from the service areas. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yeah, just um, currently at the moment um, on the TELUS website, uh, y you can't complain. Is that true? I can answer that. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. That's a good answer. Um, so you Most straight answer you're ever going to get for somebody so in politics. It, yeah. is the option there to complain then? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it within the same form as the comments and suggestions? There are a number of ways in which you can make a complaint. Um, and that is all detailed on the website. So there's various formats between telephone, email, e-form. You can even write in. Or if you telephone us, we can assist. So there's a number of ways to make a complaint. Can you do it via the TELUS process? Yes. Um, what, what, uh, yeah, I'd have to try and clarify what you mean by the TELUS process. Yeah. Because to me, the TELUS process was the old TELUS policy. Um, and this new policy, is, this is the same process. Yes. Do you mean the TELUS form? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, then yes. It's definitely on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can't access it at the moment, but it's... Uh, restricted for some reason. The last time I checked, it wasn't on there, as far as I can see. But uh, if you're saying it is, then happy days. Cabinet members aren't allowed to complain. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> right. Any further questions? No, I'd just like to uh, concur. Uh, great piece of work. It, as we change and transition to gathering more information, it can only be better for the organisation. So just keep your faith. It's it's really good. Uh, right, item 10. Um, oh, yes, before I move swiftly on, uh, I'd like to uh, ask somebody to move that report. I've, I've moved. You've moved. Second, thank you. Uh, right, to the vote, all those in favour? To the contrary? Successfully moved. Right, um, once again, thanks for all that. Uh, next is to exclude the problem. Uh, Press and public to consider the exclusion of the press and public from the meeting by pressing the, the following resolution, passing the following resolution, <coughs> which I'll read out. In accordance with the previous provisions of local authorities' ex executive arrangements, meetings and access for information to information, England Regulation 2012 and Section 100A, brackets 4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public are to be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 and of part 1 of the schedule 12a of the act and to the public interest withholding information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. At this time the agenda is to be published and no representations have been been received this part of the meeting to go to the public. Happy 
to move that. Happy to move. 